Good afternoon, and welcome to another Moment with Madison. Our initial intention had been not to say anything about the Constitution and let the states make the wise decision to ratify it on their own. However, a number of people were writing articles against its ratification, so a new tact seemed called for. Alexander Hamilton concluded that a series of articles defining the Constitution and explaining the logic for the decisions we made would be useful. He would publish the New York newspapers twice a week. He enlisted the aid of the venerable John Jay, the negotiator of the Treaty of Paris and soon to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Jay wrote four articles and then fell ill. Hamilton turned to me. I concluded that this was a project of enormous value and committed myself to writing a great number. Congress was meeting in New York City. Hamilton lived on Wall Street. I lived on Maiden Lane, so we spent a lot of time together. We would walk to Congress talking about everything. It was a hectic schedule two or three articles per week, each requiring enormous concentration and careful elucidation. It was not unusual for us to be in the printer's office finishing an article while he was typesetting the beginning of it. <laughs> in the end, Jay wrote five, I wrote 26, and Hamilton the remaining 51. On October 27th, 1787, in Federalist No. 1, Hamilton laid the blueprint for our set of articles. We all signed our names Publius, so no one would know who we were. In Federalist 2 through 5, John Jay explained why it was so vital that we be a single nation, primarily so we don't go to war with each other. I do not think that you in rare modern times can possibly appreciate our concerns about war. In the Revolution, we lost 1% of our population. In your World War II, you lost 0.3%, Vietnam 0.025%, and in the subsequent 45 years, you have lost 0.001%. In the Napoleonic Wars, Britain lost 3% of her population. France, which was considerably larger, lost 4% France lost more men in the Napoleonic Wars than the United States has lost in every war it has ever fought combined. This is what we were terrified of. The majority of the articles talked about the logic for the decisions and design of the government. The three branches balancing their power, the need for federal taxation, and the balance between state and federal governments. In Federalist 10, my most discussed and debated contribution, I talked about how different factions, such as political parties, grew and are hopes it by expanding the sphere, that is by having a large and diverse population, that the factions would not gain great power. Still, as I wrote, <clears throat> The most common and durable source of factions has been the various and unequal distribution of property. Those who hold and those who are without property have always formed distinct interests in society. As this was being published, the state ratifying conventions were beginning. Things started off well. Little Delaware, knowing that if the Constitution failed, she would soon be devoured by her neighbors. With John Dickinson in the lead, on December 7th she ratified, followed quickly by Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and many others. New Hampshire adjourned in postponement, and Wrong Island didn't even bother to hold a convention. But it was Virginia and New York which were the linchpins, and both were doubtful. I had bound copies of the Federalist sent to all the members of the Virginia Ratifying Convention. On my way home, I stopped at Mount Vernon to spend some time with General Washington. I told him that we were Publius. I did not tell Thomas Jefferson. 
He was our minister in France and was not um, familiar with the situation in America. I love my friend, but he tends to have his head in the clouds and is not always... Yeah. He suggested that we should have a series of conventions to perfect the flaws of the Constitution. Those flaws are the set of compromises we made that allowed everybody to sign it. We had a constitution. We had to ratify it as it was. We could add amendments later. In Federalist 54, I defended the constitutional compromise on slavery. How could I, who was so adamantly opposed to slavery with every fiber of my body speak in its defense. I could not. I hid behind the screen of what a typical southerner would say. I ignored the question of slavery itself and only gave the logic for the three-fifths compromise. But I know what my southern brethren would say. They would quote the Bible. Ephesians 6.5 Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. They would explain how the black men were in need of direction from the white, how they would starve if left to their own devices, how it was a kindness for the masters to care for their slaves. In Federalist 84, Hamilton explained why there was no need to have a Federal Bill of Rights. States all had their own Bill of Rights. What would a Federal one add? Moreover, there was a concern that we could not possibly list all of the natural rights of men, and by listing only some, people might infer that there were no others. At this point, the battle for ratification came to Virginia. And we shall talk about that in the next moment with Madison.